Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our lecture number two on Edith Hamilton's classic text, Mythology. We are today now working with part one, chapter one, which will be a review of the major gods and goddesses. Um, uh, I do recommend if you didn't watch uh, lecture number one that you go to our LearnStrong.net site. Go down that left hand side, find those lectures that are there collected in the folder for mythology and at least watch lecture number one for sure, that intro lecture. Um, now again, just to remind, because we've got a lot of material to cover here, my suggestion is that you would be reading this material on your own first and annotating as you go and then come back to watch and follow my lecture and participate in, uh, in this work. That will allow you to do that thing we call learning, that connecting of new information to old information, right? Now, let's just review quickly what we covered in the last lecture. Hamilton calls it the Greek miracle, that really bizarre moment in time when all this amazing stuff starts happening in terms of art, in terms of literature, and the like. Also, let's remind ourselves that the gods are understood in anthropomorphic ways. It makes them more accessible. It makes them, yeah, you can relate somehow more to them because they are, of course, pictured as humans. I want to remind you of something the great American writer Ralph Waldo Emerson said in an essay once. He said, it's a funny thing about people and their gods. Their gods have a tendency to look very much like them. And as they describe their gods in anthropomorphic terms, we'll see this uh, with the Greeks who are going to be fun-loving and yet really often violent people, and so you're going to have, you're going to have the, the, uh, their gods represented in, in so many different ways because that's what their culture was. Now let's get the basics out of the way, if you will, the dramatic personae of uh, all of the stories. All of the Greek stories are going to involve um, some version or some uh, part of these gods and goddesses. So uh, we want to uh, we we want to play that game. Also, let's remember that the Romans conquer the Greeks and fundamentally, in many ways, take over their stories, their mythologies, and therefore, for example, Zeus for the Greeks will become Jupiter for the Romans, and of course, that's the Romans spoke Latin, and so that will be the Latin name. What Hamilton is going to do for us, and this is why it's such an important text, especially this chapter, is she's going to now quickly outline for us the uh, different major gods and goddesses. So let's begin with her opening line. She says, the Greeks did not believe that the gods created the universe. It was the other way about. The universe created the gods. Before there were gods, heaven and earth had been formed. They were the first parents. The Titans were their children and the gods were their grandchildren. And so very quickly now, let's work through this information um, um, as, she, as she provides it. Beginning, of course, with the Titans. They're huge, of course, in size and strength power. Kronos is, of course, the great Titan, and Saturn is his name in Latin. And he kind of is the ruler, but his son Zeus is going to dethrone him, seize power, and of course take over. Now there will be other titans as well. Prometheus is, is one of the major ones mentioned, several uh, also provided. Of course Prometheus we know of as the fire bringer, the fire deliverer. We have the Olympians then, um, and they are called this because Olympus is where they live. Now Mount Olympus is a mountain, but later it becomes kind of an, an idealized place in, in uh, the mythologies. Uh, but let's make sure for our notes, the Greeks didn't think of Olympus as heaven, okay? When you die, you go to Olympus. The Olympus is where the gods live, and what do the gods do? Well, they kind of sit around and eat ambrosia and drink nectar, and they listen to Apollo playing on his musical instrument, a lyre, and um, they at times then will kind of, you know, see what humans are doing, and they come down, they get involved in human activities in the world and the like, right? Now, the major gods that uh, Hamilton will be playing with, she outlines early on in this chapter. The 12 Olympians made up a divine family, she says. And then she numbers them, and, uh, and you want these in your notes numbered, because this is the way we will address them. One, Zeus, Latin name Jupiter. The chief, his uh, two brothers next, Poseidon, Neptune, and Hades, also called Pluto. Fourth, Hestia, Vesta is the Latin name, their sister. Five, Hera, Juno, Zeus's wife. Six, Ares, Mars is the Latin derivative. Their son, Zeus's children. Seven, Athena, 
Minerva is the Latin name, eight, Apollo, nine, Aphrodite or Venus, 10, Hermes or Mercury, 11, Artemis or Diana, and Hera's son, Hephaestus or Vulcan, sometimes said to be the son of Zeus too. So we'll now turn to each one of these in order quickly and let's, and let's review. Now again, my hope is that you've already done this work with Edith Hamilton's mythology. My other hope is that, of course, you've done other kinds of work as well, online, elsewhere. For sure, I want to recommend, this is huge, so write this down, so that you have something to kind of connect with the information we're covering. I hope that you Google image each one of these major gods, goddesses, and take a look at the different ways that they're represented in sculpture and painting and drawing or whatever, okay? All right, let's turn now first to Zeus, Latin name Jupiter. Of course, he has all the power. Now, the way the story begins is that lots are drawn between Zeus and his two brothers, Poseidon and Hades. Hades gets the underworld, Poseidon gets the sea, Zeus is the supreme ruler, lord of the sky, and of course, he is uh, he's the one that runs the show. However, Hamilton points out, he is not omnipotent and he is not omniscient, right? He can be opposed, he even can be deceived. For example, Poseidon and Hera both will deceive him in the Iliad. And at times there'll be this debate about whether fate is actually stronger than Zeus. And he's, of course, engaged in endless love affairs, lots and lots of hanky-panky going on. Zeus um, is notorious for this, and of course this is one of the problems that any number of critiquers of, of Greek mythology, both of the time and then later, will say, have, they'll have serious problems with this uh, character flaw, we maybe would say, with Zeus. Um, certainly Socrates had his problems with the notion that we are supposed to show reverence to this uh, deity that runs around always, you know, um, 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 getting in all kinds of sexual trouble. His bird is the eagle, his tree is the oak. Uh, the second god, uh, goddess, Hera, Juno is her name. This is Zeus's wife, also sister, sometimes understood as the protector of marriage. She punishes the women that Zeus is, that Zeus is always hanky-panking with, um, and she never forgets an injury. We're always going to remember that in the Judgment of Paris part of our story, of the, Tro of the Trojan story, the Troy tale. Um, yeah, only in the quest for the Golden Fleece is she understood as a protector of heroes, most of the time not seen this way. Goddess of married women and her daughter, Alethea, helped women in childbirth and therefore was often um, given some kind of due, due uh, reverence in, when children were being born. God number three is Poseidon, also known as Neptune for the Romans, the ruler of the sea, Zeus's brother, second only to Zeus in power, right? Amphrodite is his wife. Um, and they um, um, and, and the, the thing about Poseidon as well, which is interesting because he's the god of the sea, but he gave first horses to men. You know, we live out here where horses and ponies are important to us, and so there you go. That it, it comes uh, from Poseidon. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, 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 a occasionally there's a moment here if I can do it where I want to jump in and maybe do a little bit of a, a little bit of reading um, to you as well. Um, his, uh, we're told that he's the earth shaker uh, with, his, with his triton. Um, uh, um, Zeus was, um, in, in the Iliad, Agamemnon prays, Zeus, most glorious, most great god of the storm cloud, thou that dwellest in the heavens, he demanded to not only sacrifices, but men, but right action. The Greek army at Troy is told, quote, Father Zeus never helps liars or those who help others. Um, and, 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 the, uh, and, and in the idea then of Poseidon himself, the idea here is when he drove in his golden car over the waters, the thunder of the waves sank into stillness and tranquil peace followed his smooth rolling wheels, often called the earth shaker with his trident, that three-pronged spear. There seems to be some connection as well for Poseidon with bulls, connected um, with lots of the gods bulls are. Uh, God number four, Hades, or Pluto. This is the third brother among the Olympians. Uh, he is God of the underworld, ruler over the dead. Pluto is, of course, the God of wealth as well. Precious metals are hidden in the earth. We think about that scene at the conclusion of Paradise Lost Book One. Remember when the, the demons are kind of rifling through the earth to try and get their goal. This will, for Milton, will, will derive from here. In Latin, sometimes referred to as dis, which is just Latin for the word for rich. His helmet makes the wearer invisible, Hades does. He rarely leaves the underworld, 
rarely spends any time either in Olympus or um, on Earth because he's not welcome there. He is unpitying, he's inexorable, but he's always just. He is a terrible but not considered an evil god. This is significant. His wife is Persephone, who we'll hear more about in a story in the next lecture, in the next chapter, um, the story of Persephone uh, being taken away from Demeter and all of that. King of the dead, but he is not death, okay? For the Greeks, that was Thanatos, and for the Romans, Orcus, okay? God number five, Pallas Athena, sometimes referred to, of course, by the Romans as Minerva. Um, this word Pallas, by the way, seems to mean something like brandishing a weapon, or it can also mean young woman. And some people think even later that people begin to think of Pallas as maybe the name of somebody who Athena defeats. She is the daughter of Zeus alone. That is to say, no mother bore her. She sprang full-blown from the head of Zeus full armor involved in all of that, right? The earliest account is in the Iliad, and there she is fierce and ruthless. She's a battle goddess. But in the Odyssey, remember, she is a friend to Odysseus and helps him get home. She's the goddess of the city, the protector of civilized life, handicrafts, agriculture, and the like. She is inventor of the bridle. That's significant, right? Um, and she's the first one to have tamed horses. She is Zeus's favorite child, and she carries his aegis, his buckler, his weapon, the thunderbolt, all of that is for her. She's sometimes called gray-eyed or flashing-eyed Athena. She is chief among the three virgin goddesses. She's called the maiden Parthenos. Um, that is to say, the temple, and of course we're familiar with her, and the city of Athens, and more particularly the Parthenon, right? Later poetry says that she embodies wisdom, um, reason, purity. Athens, of course, is her city. The tree is the olive, which was created by her. And her bird, of course, since she is known for wisdom, is the owl, right? God number six, uh, Phoebus uh, Apollo. There's no Latin name for Apollo. He is the son of Zeus and Leto, or Latina, born in the island of Delos, the most Greek of all the gods, Hamilton will say about Apollo, beautiful, master musician, plays for the gods with uh, his lyre. He's the lord of the silver bow, the archer god, far shooting, if you will. He's also the healer, the first who taught men medicine, right? He's the god of light, the god of truth, he cannot lie. Apollo's oracle as well, right? In Delphi, under Parnassus, the large mountain there. Castile is the sacred spring. Um, Cephisiris is the, is the river there, considered the uh, center of the world. And without question, the most important shrine in all of Greek culture. Remember, it is at, uh, at Delphi that Socrates is said to have been told by the oracle that he, Socrates, was the greatest, uh, wisest of all men, right? The priestess would go into a trance there uh, with a three-legged stool, that tripod. There would be vapors that came out of the ground. And out of there, uh, the, the priestess then would make her predictions or, 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 or her orations, the oracle. Um, sometimes called Delian from um, Delos or Pythian because he killed the python at the caves of Parnassus um, with his uh, arrows. Um, the, uh, Lucian, uh, uh, the wolf, is sometimes associated with Apollo, god of light, god of uh, Lycia. Um, the Smithian, where it's sometimes referred to in the Iliad, um, it also seems to have some reference to mice. Um, not sure exactly why, whether he destroys mice or he protects mice. He, of course, is the sun god. Actually, the sun god is Helios, the child of Hyperion, uh, the titan. Um, but um, for Phobos, he is brilliant, understood, is shining all the time. Um, he is Apollo at Delphi. There's a link between the gods and men here. How to make peace with the gods is understood, right? He is the purifier. He can forgive even those who maybe even kill family members. In a few stories, Apollo is actually pitiless. He is often cruel. There are two ideas which seem to kind of struggle between uh, in regards to Apollo. One is that primitive, kind of crude view, um, and the other is, is Apollo is beautiful and poetic. The laurel is his tree, coming from the story of him chasing Daphne and her falling down, begging Zeus for escape, and he turns her into a laurel tree. We'll have more of that from uh, Hamilton later. 
Um, and many creatures are sacred to him, but chief among those are the dolphin and the crow. And of course, you'll think about the bust of uh, um, Pallas uh, um, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the bust there uh, for Poe's, Edgar Allan Poe's, the raven, right? Okay, got number seven is Artemis. The Latin derivation is Diana, or Cynthia, from Mount Cynthius in Delos. Um, she's Apollo's twin sister. She's one of three maiden goddesses of the Olympias. Um, Vesta, Hestia is one, Athena, and then Artemis. Lover of woods and the wild chase. She's the lady of wild things, huntsman in chief, if you will, which is, of course, an odd office for a woman in a, a patriarchal masculine culture. She is the protector of youth. Ironically, though, she will be the one that will demand the sacrifice of Iphigenia in the Troy tale when we finally get to it. She is fierce. She is revengeful. Very, very scary, right? Um, although she was sometimes thanked if women died quickly and painless. It was a gift from her. Uh, she's considered Phobos, that is to say, um, the, related to Sun and to Apollo. She is Phoebe, the moon, right? If um, Apollo is the sun, she is the moon. Um, Selene, or Luna in Latin. Uh, later poets will identify her with Hecate. We think immediately, don't we, of Shakespeare's Macbeth, right? The goddess um, um, with three forms. She's Selene in the sky, Artemis on earth, Hecate in the underworld, or the nighttime sky, right? When the moon is hidden, she's associated with deeds of darkness, the goddess of the crossways, the palaces of evil magic. Just to read a couple of lines um, from our text on this one, um, she's, um, um, she, we read, uh, Hamilton says, in her, in, in uh, Artemis, is shown most vividly the uncertainty between good and evil, which is apparent in every one of the, div of the divinities. There is a strange, uh, kind of interesting transformation between the lovely huntress and the evil witch. Um, in her is shown a a as well um, this idea of this, this tension uh, back and forth between the, the, that which should be feared and that which should be adored, right? The tree for her is her cypress tree, which is sacred, and all wild animals, but especially the deer. Uh, God number eight, Aphrodite, Venus in Latin, goddess of love and beauty. She's also the great deceiver, right? Both for gods as well as for men. She's the laughter-loving goddess. She is the irresistible goddess, even for the wise. Uh, she, can, she can mess with a wise man's head. She's the daughter of Zeus and Diana, according to the Iliad. Later, she sprung from the foam of the sea. Um, her name, actually, um, Aphros, is uh, from the Greek, which means foam, risen, right? Fo um, the idea of foam, risen out of the sea. Um, she, near um, Cytheria, she floats to Cyprus, and so she's often called either Cytheria or Cyprus. Um, the, the, uh, there's, a, there's a poem that's associated with her um, that Hamilton will provide us with. The breath of the west wind bore her over the sounding sea, up from the delicate foam to the, wa to the wave ringed cypress her isle, and the hour's golden wreath welcomed her joyously. They clad her in raiment immortal and brought her to the gods. Wonder seized them all as they saw violet crowned Cynthia. Um, and, and, and to continue, uh, the Romans, she says, wrote of her in the same way. With her beauty comes. The winds flee before her in the storm clouds. Sweet flowers embroider the earth. The waves of the sea laugh. She moves in radiant light. Without her, there's no joy nor loveliness anywhere. This is the picture the poets like best to paint of her. But she had another side too. It was natural that she should cut a poor figure in the Iliad where the battle of heroes is the theme. She is soft, weak creature there whom a mortal need not fear to attack. In later poems, she's usually shown as treacherous, malicious, exerting a, deadless and a deadly and destructive power over men. She is the wife of Hephaestus, Vulcan, who we'll get to in a moment, the lame, the ugly god, note the irony, the most beautiful goddess is married to the ugliest of the gods. Her tree is the myrtle tree, her bird, not surprisingly, the dove, sometimes though the sparrow, sometimes even the swan, okay? God number nine is Hermes, referred to as Mercury, Zeus is his father. Maya, the daughter of Atlas, is his mother. Because of a popular number of statues, he is probably the best known god of all of the gods. Graceful, fast, winged sandals on his feet, wings on his low-crowned hat. 
he has this magic wand, right? The Catesis. Um, and Zeus's messenger in almost all of the different uh, stories, right? He's the most cunning. He's the shrewdest of all the gods. He's a master thief. Before he's a day old, we're told, um, the babe was born at the break of day, and ere the night fell, he had stolen away Apollo's herds. So he steals Apollo's cattle. Zeus makes them give him back. He returns and, and asks for um, forgiveness with the lyre, and that's why Apollo has the lyre. He's the god of commerce and the market. He's the protector of traders. In contrast, also, he's the solemn guide of the dead, the divine herald, the, the one who leads the souls to their last home. He appears most often, let's put that in our notes, Hermes appears most often in the myths more than any other god. God number 10 is Ares, or Mars, the god of war, the son of Zeus and Hera, but both of them hated him. He's hated throughout the Iliad, a song of war, right? And yet, hated throughout the Iliad for reasons that maybe um, would, would make you know, some, you know, some sense. Um, this is the way uh, Hamilton will have it. The god of war, son of Zeus and Hera, both of whom Homer says detested him. Indeed, he's hateful throughout the Iliad poem of war, though it is. Occasionally, the heroes... Rejoice in the delight of Ares' battle, but more far oftener in having escaped the fury of the ruthless god. Homer calls him murderous, blood-stained, the incarnate curse of mortals, and strangely a coward, too, who bellows with pain and runs away when he's wounded. Yet he has a train of attendants on the battlefield which would inspire anyone with confidence. His sister is there, Ares, which means discord, and strife, her son, the goddess of war, Eno, in Latin, Bologna, walks beside him, and with her are terror and trembling and panic. As they move, the voice of groaning arises behind them, and the earth streams with blood. The Romans, Hamilton continues, liked Mars better than the Greeks liked Ares. He never was to them the mean, whining deity of the Iliad, that magnificent and shining armor, invincible. The warriors of the great Latin,